So hi everyone and welcome to the South to South Just Transitions Initiative event at London Climate Action Week on exploring just transitions in the global south. Um, my name's Nia Hunjin and I'm a programs associate here at Climate Strategies and also the project manager of our South to South Just Transitions Initiative. So this event will involve two panel discussions, the first with our researchers based in Asia and the second with our researchers based in Africa. And following this, there will then be a short Q&A session from the audience. So please, please feel free to post questions in the Q&A box as the event goes on. And also just to let you know that the event is being recorded and will subsequently be uploaded to our website if anyone wants to um, rewatch or share, that would be great. So um, the South South Just Transitions Initiative is currently home to a network of nine countries based in Latin America. We have Argentina and Colombia, um, Africa, we have Kenya, Malawi and Ghana. And in Asia, we have Indonesia, Bangladesh, Laos and Vietnam. And as we know, there is no one size fits all for a just transition. And this initiative uses South to South knowledge sharing and bespoke research support to develop alternative and context specific just transition strategies across different and relevant sectors. And we wouldn't be able to do any of this without our amazing in-country researchers who provide the local expertise, knowledge and skills needed for developing just transition strategies. And this initiative is constantly kind of learning, growing and expanding, expanding. So if anyone is kind of interested in learning more or becoming part of it, um, please um, get in contact. Um, so earlier this year, our network co-created a report with some of our initial findings. Um, and you can find this report on our project website. And in this report, we identified some of the recurring challenges for countries in the global south, which need to be recognized when planning for a just transition. Um, and you can see these on the tiles here. I kind of won't go through all of these, but just to mention one as an example. Um, so the first one is that many countries in the global south have high incidences of informal workers, which are sometimes regarded as illegal workers. And this is kind of a challenge for a number of reasons, for example, including these in formal dialogue or kind of formal decision making processes. Um, yeah, but please take a look at our latest report to kind of look at these in more detail um, and you can find it on our website, as I mentioned. Um, and as the initiative, we've kind of identified these 12 key challenges and considerations, and we're now kind of working on how to practically overcome these challenges and are exploring different solutions and opportunities for just transitions. Um, so that's a kind of quick summary from me um, of what we've been doing so far. And now let me introduce our first panel for today. So our first panel is exploring perspectives on just transitions across Asia. So firstly, we have Tari, who is an associate researcher at the Dala Institute in Indonesia. Um, the Dala Institute provides research and consultation to explain and identify solutions to issues at the nexus between nature and society. And Tari with the Dala Institute has been part of this initiative since its inception in 2020. Um, second on the panel, we have Minhas, who is an associate professor at the University of Liberal Arts in Bangladesh. And the Bangladesh team have involved a number of researchers across different disciplines as part of this initiative, as part of this project. And Minhas has expertise in the ready-made garment sector. And um, the third member of our panel, we have actually two members from our Vietnam team. Um, we have Mai, um, who's shown on the screen, and we also have Neen. And they are well, Mai is a lecturer at the Hanoi University of Science and Technology, and Neen is the director of the Vietnam Initiative for Energy Transition and Social Enterprise. And um, I mentioned 
um, Tari has been involved in the initiative since 2020. Um, Min has and the Vietnam team have been involved um, since August last year. So newer, newer members of the initiative. So my first question will go to Tari. Let me stop sharing my screen. Um, so Tari, the Dala Institute have been pioneering, pioneering just transition in Indonesia for a few years now and working closely with um, government as an advisor on just transition. And since becoming part of the South to South network, the government have included just transition in its low carbon strategy and the Ministry of Manpower, which are responsible for workers have produced a study on the impact of climate change on employment. And so what have you kind of found to be the challenges and opportunities in this role um, in Indonesia? Okay, uh, thank you, Nia. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So I think I'm going to turn off my, um, my uh, video because sometime I got some, um, sorry, some um, technical problem because the internet is not really stable here. Um, so, let me know if you can already see, uh, see my screen. Yeah, we can see. You might want to put it in full screen. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to put it a bit there so you can see a bit more. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, as Nia mentioned, my name is Tari. I'm a research associate at Dala Institute in Indonesia. I've been working on the issue of just transition with the government of Indonesia since the end of 2019. To start with, um, I'd like to give a bit of overview of the development of just transition in Indonesia. After Paris Agreement, issues such as environmental justice and social inclusion have been actually included in several policy documents, including in the first version of the NDC. However, um, there wasn't a clear definition and a clear mechanism to achieve this. And in 2018, uh, the government of Indonesia signed the Silesia Declaration, which marked the beginning of just transition path in Indonesia formally. In the next couple of years, there were not many significant developments, except that the Ministry of Manpower initiated a three-partite dialogue on climate change and workers. Um, also, um, the majority of stakeholders have never heard about Just Transition. Then in 2021, uh, Just Transition gained more popularity, especially as the government of Indonesia set its target for net zero emission. Just Transition was then incorporated in some policy documents such as the updated NDC, long-term strategy document, and low carbon development initiative or LCDI. In addition, um, several ministries have also started to talk about just transition, initiated and or participated in some initiative related to just transition. However, this positive, this positive development mostly happens at the national level and concrete actions and plans for the transition that is just and inclusive had not been really developed yet. But by just and inclusive here, I mean that uh, the social aspects of transition are fully incorporated in addition on the technical aspect of transition. This year though, um, there is a very crucial event that affects just transition agenda in Indonesia, especially Indonesia as the world's largest coal exporter. And this event, as you know, is the uh, Russian-Ukrainian war that shifts the political economy of international energy. Coal price rises sharply, reaching up to four times of the price in the early 2021, and demand for Indonesian coal increased significantly. So what does it mean for the agenda of just transition in Indonesia? This is a very interesting discussion in Indonesia right now, as everyone tries to navigate how to balance economic gains for the country's development while still trying to pursue a just energy transition. And um, and from that perspective, I'd like to move into challenges and opportunities for just transition in Indonesia. As a country that benefits from the rise in coal demand and coal price, it is not unusual that there are conflicting interests. 
uh, the urgency of ensuring a just energy transition is lower than before. Some people also point out that uh, the issue of inter or between country equity, which means that if other countries, especially developed countries, are turning back into coal, while developing countries like Indonesia has to supply coal to fulfill uh, their energy demands, regardless of the economic gain that Indonesia gets, why do developing countries like Indonesia have to suffer its economic development for fulfilling their contribution for, for climate actions? Um, well, I'm not going to go into detail for each point because I only have six minutes, but I just want to highlight that in general, um, public understanding of yeah. environmental issues. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, okay, can I actually, uh, sorry. Okay, I think I can continue. Um, in general, um, public understanding of environmental issues, climate change, and the need for transition is relatively low, including within the government, except select few, those that are working on the climate change topic or those that are going to the international uh, conferences. So this makes it difficult for them to be able to think holistically and integrate climate issues, including just transition in all aspects daily aspect of policies and, uh, and program. Then uh, I previously mentioned that in 2021, there were past positive developments from government agencies, but there is this missing link um, that there is no good and effective mechanism for coordination specific to just transition in Indonesia. Just transition is a cross-cutting issues that require close um, collaboration among many stakeholders, to ensure that to ensure that all aspects of from financing, technical, and social are being addressed. However, um, there is always a hope. The increased popularity and understanding of just transition in the past couple of years has significantly changed the atmosphere in Indonesia. More discussions and studies on just transitions are being carried out. So the baseline or the foundation for just transition planning is getting stronger. More donors and multilateral development banks also show their interest to facilitate the process of just transition in Indonesia. This is actually an opportunity for the government uh, to complement the areas or action that they are still lacking or that they, are, that they still need support. And lastly, um, because I talk a lot about, uh, about coal, um, some of the revenue from coal, which is currently increased significantly, can also be actually set aside to finance the planning process and the implementation of just transition in the future. Um, thank you. I think um, I'll stop here. Thanks, Tari. Um, it's really interesting to hear how you like the latest kind of developments with the Russian Ukraine war have also kind of need to be considered massively when um, planning a just transition. And I think that's kind of a new area that we'll kind of explore as part of this initiative. Um, so the next question um, goes to Minhaz, um, based at ULAB in Bangladesh. Um, and the question is kind of from your work as part of this project, you're focusing on several sectors. Um, these include the ready-made garment sector, agriculture and energy. And as we kind of know, the ready-made garment sector has gained a lot of media attention um, from across the world and subsequently faced a number of reforms. Um, and kind of how do you think a uh, just transition framing here helps and kind of what are the challenges and opportunities it addresses? Okay, thank you, Nia. So here, um, if I just uh, go back one year ago, so uh, since the inception of, so since we joined uh, the just, just Transition Consortium in the last August, so in fact, the just transition was not so popular and not too much literature can be found in Bangladesh related with the just transition. So uh, the ULAP is kind of uh, playing a role as a pioneer to popularize the just transition and trying to explore that how uh, just transition is relevant to several sectors, particularly energy, uh, agriculture, and also ready-made garments industry. So today, uh, I'd like to focus on the uh, how just transition is relevant uh, in the ready-made garments industry in our country, and uh, 
what are the challenges and opportunities to, uh, to implement just transition in this sector. So uh, certain uh, trends or issues has been observed uh, in the recent years. For example, a number of uh, factories are becoming uh, the green factories by getting the LEED certificate. Uh, then the, 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 a good number of factories is also converting uh, the automation. Uh, then the living standard of RMG workers is a major issue in our country. Then discrimination against the female workers is also another issue. And uh, the inclusive decision-making, like especially uh, when the workers are a major stakeholder. So how much has been observed? So these are the things that I'd like to discuss a little bit. First of all, the LEED certificate, we don't have any reservation about it. Uh, it is really a good thing that many factories are trying to reduce the waste and they are trying to improve the uh, environment, work environment of the factory. They are trying to use different uh, types of renewable energy sources. Uh, they're also reducing uh, the energy cost, they're uh, practicing water recycling. So all these are very good. However, um, in my opinion, it's kind of, you know, factory based. And somehow the, I don't see uh, how the, um, uh, the workers are becoming beneficiary of all this investment at large. So, um, so uh, for example, a lead certified factory, um, but outside outside the factory, the environment remains unchanged. For example, the workers while working in the factory, probably he's enjoying the good environment, but once he uh, goes back to his slum, then he faces this harsh reality. So overall, um, we don't see much change in the uh, environment or, or uh, the improvement of the living standards. So, if this uh, certification somehow can include the welfare of the workers, then probably uh, this transition, this change can be holistic and fair. This is, uh, this is what I think. Uh, so basically the choice is between should we invest in the factory or should we invest for the welfare of the workers? So uh, we face a choice in, in this regard. Uh, same goes for automation. You know, uh, needless to say that automation can improve the uh, productivity, quality, and also reduce the cost. But it has been estimated that by 2030, at least 60% of workers will lose their job as a result of automation. Even uh, the uh, large number of workers are trained, still probably uh, they will not be accommodated in the fully automated uh, factories. So there will always be a surplus labor and this might create a social unrest. So again, the choices between uh, investment in technology or uh, sustained employment. So this change, somehow we see that this change is not incorporating uh, the, uh, the workers or their, their future. Um, the living standard is definitely a major issue uh, of country and uh, why do they have poor living standards? The answers are very simple because they don't get uh, enough wage. And uh, although they get the uh, national, uh, according to the national pay scale, but uh, it is not adjusted to the rising inflation. Inflation is also another issue and the, especially the food prices are increasing tremendously and the food price increases. One of the reasons is obviously climate change. Due to the climate change, the country faces flash flood. Currently, a large number of uh, cities and the rural areas around uh, these are affected uh, with flood. So all those agriculture products has been damaged. So, and this, is, this happens almost in every alternative year. So this uh, causes um, a major uh, you know, challenge for the uh, food security. Also the general infrastructure, for example, the communication and also utility services, these are also dilapidated. So uh, all this 
causes the lower living standards of the uh, RMG workers in Bangladesh. Discrimination against women is also observed uh, when uh, a man and woman uh, have the same quality for a job. We see that the man, uh, the male worker, uh, enjoys more benefits, more salary, more increases than other uh, facilities, uh, and uh, this discrimination is partially explained uh, by the uh, the patriarchal society uh, of Bangladesh. Also, uh, the women for women, there is not much job diversity. And uh, they cannot even diversify their job because of their poor skill and poor education. So um, an inclusive decision making, for example, the uh, uh, lead certification and automation, these two are vital a vital decision for, for a company. Now, while they are making this choice, do they include workers? Uh, do they ask any question to the workers whether they like it or not? I mean, so we do not see much practice of inclusive decision making in major corporate decisions. So, um, so why are this happening? So I see that the challenge is because after all, it's a capitalist economy. So all problems finally boils down to monetary issues. So uh, lead certificate is obviously a good thing, but uh, you know, to, to convert into a green factory the amount of capital is tremendous. Not too many factories can afford it. And also the interest rate for bank loan and others is also pretty high. Uh, the operating cost is also increasing recently due to the rising shipping costs, transportation cost. The Bangladeshi Taka currency has been depreciating recently for which the import cost is also increasing. The energy price is also increasing. On the other hand, uh, there is a reduction in the orders from the Western buyers, because uh, the Europe and America, particularly European countries, has also been suffering from the ongoing recession, energy crisis, and other issues. So that's why uh, there is a reduction, you know, in consumption of the fancy or fashionable products. So uh, those non-essential products, uh, purchase of the non-essential products has reduced, which eventually translated into the shrinking revenue for the uh, garments uh, for the factory. Now, not too much opportunity that I see. However, uh, three opportunities came to my knowledge. So Minhas, government has, sorry, yes. Sorry yes. to interrupt, but um, we need to wrap up okay. um, the section, that's okay. All right, so uh, can I just uh, sh sh say a few words about this slide? Yes, yeah. Okay. So uh, the government has initiated some uh, facilities for uh, green projects with a reduced interest rate. There are many indigenous uh, companies which are coming forward with green technology. And uh, recently we see an upgrade, uh, you know, improvements in the textile education, especially the major in sustainable textile. So if we employ or engage these opportunities, uh, there is a chance that just transition might have a leap forward in our country. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Minhas. That was really interesting to hear about the RNG sector because I feel like you don't really get to hear about it that much um, in relation to just transition. So great, um, great perspective. Um, also, I have noticed that the chat is um, kind of being a bit corrupted. So I apologize to anyone who's had to to look at that but we've disabled it and um if you could just use the q a function for now um that would be optimal um okay so the last member of this panel is uh Neen from vietnam and the question i have for you is that um so vietnam has one of the most growing demands for electricity in the world with 46% of its total electricity output coming from coal-fired power plants. But what does the just transition in the energy sector need to consider here? Yeah, thank you very much for the to let us um, have some minute to discuss about the case of Vietnam. Uh, so let me uh, share the screen with you guys. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. So uh, we can see that uh, if we look at the NDC report from Vietnam in 2020, then we can see uh, 30, uh, 73 percent CO2 emission has come from the energy sector, and uh, 49 um, percent CO2 emission has come from the power sector. So uh, we also can see that the the situation of the energy sector in Vietnam is we have a total a primary energy supply is 1.5 time um, in the in the last five years and um, the total final energy consumption is 1.4 uh, times and the TPS uh, per GDP is 1.1 times and the electricity consumption per capita is uh, 1.4 times so that means the demand is increasing uh, very quickly and uh, it's also bring quite a lot of um, issue for Vietnam. Uh, so we uh, from 2000, uh, before 2020 of uh, 2015, uh, we wasn't, uh, we are using the, lo the domestic uh, coal to uh, produce uh, electricity. But after 2015, then um, Vietnam become a country to import um, coal uh, to produce electricity. So you can see the net energy import uh, in Vietnam is increasing from 2015 uh, until 2020. We import 48% uh, to produce electricity. And uh, most of the coal um, the import to Vietnam are using uh, for the, the, the to, to, um, to produce uh, electricity. So uh, we, uh, when we look at the power uh, system in Vietnam, we can see that uh, from 2010 until 2015 is uh, 11, uh, is, uh, the demand is increasing 11% uh, per year. Uh, and after that, uh, due to the COVID, the demand is reduced, but it's still 7% per year. So near was very right that the, the, the total uh, demand of the LHT in Vietnam is increasing around like uh, 9% per year. And most of the electricity are come from the coal power plant and uh, gas. So um, um, from that, we also can see the high risk of the energy security in Vietnam is we can see the price uh, of the coal uh, in the market is increasing, especially in the last one year. It was like um, some up and down sometime and in the last six months, it was like uh, keep continue increasing. So we can see the risk of the countries at the energy security. Um, and it's also like a being quite a lot of issue uh, for the country to have enough electricity for the future of the economy uh, development. Um, when we look at that, we also can see that uh, there are a lot of the action from the Vietnam uh, government that they provide a uh, fit in tariff uh, for the renewable energy. So in the last three years from 2018 up to 2000. Um, uh, 21, we have uh, 147 uh, solar plant equal to 8.8 .8, uh, gigawatt and 104,000 um, uh, 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 rooftop solar system equal to 727 gigawatt. We also have uh, 84 wind park um, equal to 4.6 gigawatt. So the government was introduced the uh, uh, fitting tariff. Uh, for the solar and green, in, and it's quite successful. Since we can see the react from the market is very positive. Um, we also can see that uh, the government have a, a long-term strategy to reduce the CO2 emission as permitted in the, uh, um, in the COP26. Uh, so we, we see here um, the future of the uh, energies, um, energy uh, system in Vietnam, it will be reduce the use of, uh, from the coal and gas. And um, up to 2050, we may have a very less um, percentage of the energy come from the coal and gas. And we also can see that there are a lot of the uh, 
um, solution that the government, uh, the, the researcher and government and policymaker are discussing about the capture, uh, carbon capture storage and uh, some other uh, solution like hydrogen and, and, and um, further uh, development of the offshore wind energy in Vietnam. Um, so we, we, we can see that uh, there are some, um, some, some um, strength, for example, the government's commitment uh, in the energy transition, uh, strong development of the energy infrastructure, um, re renewable energy resource is um, like, um, uh, we could see is the, the, um, the benefit of the location of Vietnam, actually. And then we also have uh, quite a lot of uh, opportunity here, for example, like for the green growth, and uh, circular economy, which is supported by the government. And uh, we also can see the attract of the green uh, investment uh, in the in uh, energy sector, uh, the technology and finance assets uh, in the global energy transition and the involvement in the global supply chains from Vietnam side. But we, uh, besides that, we also can see the weakness of uh, issue for Vietnam. For example, we have a limited level of the science technology. So we can see the most of the solar and green um, plan in Vietnam are imported equipment from the developed country. So we need to, we, we can see we need um, to uh, develop and improve the high quality human resources. And we also uh, can see that we are like of the legal framework for the renewable energy and energy efficiency. Um, we also can see uh, the government not yet have a, uh, a long-term or detailed mechanism uh, to, in, uh, to in encourage the localization uh, rate of the uh, new technology and uh, the energy market is still early in the early state. Um, the other tips that we can see is uh, energy supply security uh, for the socioeconomic development um, that could have uh, some uh, bad impact. The conflict of the interest uh, between the traditional energy source and the renewable energy, uh, the geopolitical impact of the supply and price. For example, we can see the war in Bitcoin between the Russia and, uh, and Ukraine have some impact to the, um, and, uh, to the coal and gas price. And it somehow also indirect, directly impact to the uh, energy sector in Vietnam. But um, yeah, and, and it's also required quite uh, a, a larger capital uh, to invest into the energy infrastructure um, development and uh, developing the human resources in line with the energy transition situation. So those are the, the summary from our team uh, on the, uh, the transition uh, in Vietnam. Uh, we can see um, if we want um, uh, from the Vietnam side, uh, we still need to have a more uh, transfer of the new technology, new knowledge from the uh, developed country so that we can see the results in the energy transition in Vietnam. I would like to end my um, slide as well. Thanks, Neen. Um, great to see what the um, Vietnam uh, team are doing in this um, in this part of this initiative. So thank you. Um, I will now um, introduce our second panel. Um, so this is looking at um, different perspectives of just transitions across. Africa. Um, but just a reminder, firstly, that if anyone has any questions and they'd like to ask in the Q&A, please feel free to post them in the Q&A um, Q box and um, also kind of state who they are directed to. Um, so yeah, the second panel is exploring different perspectives on just transitions across Africa. Um, firstly, we have Richard Mulwa, who is the Director and Senior Research Fellow at Environment for Development in Kenya, based at the University of Nairobi. And um, Richards has been part of this initiative since the autumn last year. Um, we then have Herbert, who is the Director of the Center of Environmental Policy and Advocacy in Malawi, um, a policy think tank on environmental and natural resources. He's also been um, engaged with this initiative since the autumn of last year. 
And our final um, panelist is Kwabina. Um, he is a professor of economics at the University of Ghana, um, the Department of Agricultural Economics and Agribusiness. And he, um, with the Ghana team, have been working with climate strategies on this project since um, 2020. Um, so I will um, stop sharing and pose the first question to Richard. Um, so um, Richard, the Kenya team are looking at managing transitions across different sectors. And these include industry, tourism, waste, energy, agriculture, transport, and forestry. So a huge variety. Um, but what are the main considerations in kind of a cross-sectoral transition? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Nia. I believe that I'm audible. I will just speak into the question that you asked. And let me say that after we uh, signed the Paris Agreement, uh, I think in 2016, we committed ourselves uh, and we, we had the NDC. Uh, the first one was in 2015, which um, uh, committed to reduction of emissions by 30%, the greenhouse gases emissions by 30% in the country. And this has been revised to 32% in the latest NDC, uh, which is the 2021. And a number of sectors have been identified. There is a document, a key document in the country, which we call the National Climate Change Response Strategy. And it has identified a number of sectors where most of the action in emissions reduction is going to take place. Now, some of these would include energy, transportation, I think you've enumerated them, agriculture, industry, uh, forestry, waste, and uh, tourism. Now we try to look across uh, these uh, sectors, uh, most of them as you've mentioned them, and each one of them I think has concerns with just transitions. Now, if you look at our NDC, uh, the term just transition there just appears in the NDC. Uh, it's, it's, it's not strongly addressed, although it's something that uh, we need to be uh, to look into as we move forward in the country. Now, let me start with energy, for example. If you look at the energy sector in this country, uh, what is happening is that 68% of the energy consumed, I think, in this country is from biomass energy. That's massive. I think electricity is about 10%. And uh, we pride ourselves in the fact that about 95% of our grid is renewable, largely from geothermal and uh, also hydro. Uh, and other sources. Uh, but the problem is, uh, is, is transiting and moving the, the majority of the group that are using the biomass energy, uh, which are mostly rural households. Uh, and most of them that are poor, their government efforts to try and connect these households to energy and try to move them. But there are some hindrances. For instance, we have the connectivity fee, which is about $150 for connection. Of course, that would uh, uh, exclude a number of households because many of them might not afford uh, that, that kind of money. And then uh, the next one is um, transportation. Now, if you look at our transportation in this country, we are largely served by uh, vans, uh, which we call matatus in this country. And they, there has been, uh, a project that has been started by the government, the bus rapid transportation. They are testing it on one of the highways in, in Nairobi here. And we did a survey and we tried to talk to the uh, people that operate these public transportation vehicles. And they were protesting that this one is going to take away the jobs from them. Now, uh, if you look at this sector, most of the people, we have drivers, we have contactors, we have maintenance people, uh, and all these are likely to be impacted if we go the direction of trying to clean the transport sector, trying to move to green, green transportation. So some of them are likely to lose, and these are issues that have to be tackled. They need to be discussed. Where is it that we are going to absorb these people, or what do we do? 
And this cuts across gender, both uh, men and, and, and women, especially. When we get to the waste, um, just picking the sectors, uh, not in any order, when we go to the waste, uh, the country produces about 25,000 uh, metric tons of waste, solid waste every year. In Nairobi itself, we are producing about 2,400 2, metric tons of solid waste uh, a day. That's, that's a lot of waste. And most of it is dumped in, in a particular locality in the city. And there are people that are depending on this waste. For example, they, they, they collect the waste and they take it back for recycling. In 2017 or so, the government introduced the plastic ban. And what happened is that a number of factories were closed and a number of jobs were also lost in the country. So uh, as we move forward and as we try to transit, then there are issues that have to be discussed in the waste sector. If we have to start landfills, the people that are depending on the, the, the waste sector now, especially the ones that are, are in this dump site and they are collecting this, many of them and there are quite a number are likely to lose their livelihoods. So we need to know when we are transiting, where is it that we are going to be putting them? Finally, I'll talk about the tourism sector in the country. And this one is highly dependent on climate sensitive sectors. So for instance, largely tourism here in Kenya is, uh, is spoken in the same breath as, as, as wildlife. And wildlife is largely affected by climate change. Now, you also add that the effect of COVID. I think we are trying to recover from COVID-19. And of course, uh, we, we have the coastal beaches, which are also uh, impacted by climate change. So if we, we want to transit again in this sector, a number of uh, uh, initiatives have been taken. For example, we are trying to use clean energy in this sector. We are trying to uh, improvise um, on, on where to get water from. So it's important that we have these discussions of uh, uh, just transitions. So we don't leave people behind. So I would say in a nutshell in this country, what is missing is data, especially of who is going to be left behind. Then there's the issue of financing, which is very critical, and the issue of political goodwill. So if we are able to get those three things correctly, then we'll be moving in the right direction. So I want to stop there, Nia, and thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks so much. Um, so now I'll move on to Herbert, who is based in Malawi. Um, so Malawi is a very interesting country to work with on climate transitions, as the transition debates in the energy sector do not always kind of begin from the premise of a low carbon transition. And Malawi is currently, at the moment, um, powered mostly by hydropower and biomass. However, um, in efforts to kind of develop and industrialize the government is now considering um, kind of expanding to coal power. So kind of as well as this, also the country is undergoing transitions in different sectors in forestry and agriculture. So Herbert, what are the most kind of difficult challenges and yeah, how do you think they can be managed? Um. Thank you so much to uh, participants and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to share uh, aspects of Malawi's pathway to a just transition. Allow me to uh, cl close my video a bit. Um, yes, uh, so as, 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 as the, uh, the, the moderator has said, so Malawi is a unique context in the sense that uh, unlike most of the developed economies uh, where the just transition discourse is mostly about shifting away from uh, fossil fuel intensive uh, production systems to uh, low carbon energy. In the case of Malawi, um, energy is basically um, hydro and the biomass as well. And so for that reason, we are a country that um, basically needs, um, in terms of just transition within the energy sector, much of it has to do with the, the implications of uh, the energy mix on the rural poor. 
um, and even the urban setup who depend mostly on biomass for energy. And we are talking about, um, we're talking about uh, charcoal, which is usually obtained from forestry resources illegally, which is leading to a lot of deforestation. And uh, that means that uh, in terms of even climate impacts, it also contributes to uh, a lot of uh, vulnerability because people have to rely on uh, unsustainably uh, harvested wood um, to uh, supply their energy needs. Uh, meanwhile, there are opportunities within the country in terms of energy uh, because uh, it has been proven that we can invest even in renewable energy and there are some projects that are coming up However, in terms of the development trajectory that the country has taken, uh, the blueprint is that uh, there is now a commitment and a plan to invest more in core um, energy as, 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 a, as a key agenda for industrialization, which is uh, encapsulated in Malawi 2063, um, which is a national domestication of uh, the African development agenda. So, that is one of the challenges that we have. And so in terms of just transition, the energy sector tends to interface a lot with the forestry sector. And the, in that context, with regard to forestry, then uh, the vulnerabilities are in the sense that uh, on, on, on one hand, we do, we do have narrow energy options um, for people, the urban, the urban poor, because apart from charcoal, which is harvested illegally, uh, they do not have access to alternative energy sources such as um, I mean, I mean, any any other um, uh, because even electricity itself, not many people can afford it. So because of that, uh, one has to look at what are the options that one would give to those people. At the same time, the people who are supplying the energy, who are supplying the, the biomass energy, especially charcoal, are people who are vulnerable and they need to earn a living. They need to have an income, and the the charcoal strategy that the country has, which is one of the um, uh, uh, the frameworks that is guiding how to address deforestation in the country. Uh, one of among the key pillars that are there, one of it is to strengthen law enforcement. And uh, that in itself is a challenge in the context where people do not have so many alternative options of livelihoods in the rural setup or where this energy, where this charcoal is harvested. So um, addressing the livelihood needs of those people, which is also one of the pillars uh, in the charcoal strategy is one of the options, one of the opportunities for a just transition to a low carbon economy. In terms of agriculture, um, this is also very key in the national context because within the Malawi 2063, which as I said earlier on is a key blueprint for national development, um, agriculture is highlighted, highlighted as one of the uh, key, key pillars for development. And indeed, because our national economy is primarily agro-based, um, it is also the sector that is highly vulnerable and highly impacted by climate change, uh, because much of it is basically rain-fed agriculture, and it contributes to the highest proportion of uh, foreign exchange, um, but also contributes to employment. Uh, about 40% of the national employment is from agriculture. Um, or rather uh, GDP, uh, and in terms of employment, then it's 80% that comes from agriculture. But now with the impacts of climate change, what it means is um, you have to invest a lot in adaptation. And so for that to happen, it means resources, resources and resources, but also it means that one has to put in place plans that are addressing not only the needs of increasing production, but increasing production in a way that is uh, sensitive to the needs of the vulnerable poor. Now, if you look at the development agenda uh, that I talked about, then the key in, in that particular pillar is that agriculture has to be commercialized, which is a good thing in terms of increasing incomes, but how you commercialize is the key uh, challenge that um, one is seeing in the national development, because um, you have players coming in, especially in terms of foreign direct investment, some of whose model for agricultural investments are not necessarily pro poor or they are not addressing the needs of the vulnerable poor because you would have situations where a lot of land is actually set aside from people who are vulnerable or depending on, agri on, on agriculture for their survival. That land is being set aside for commercial investments in agriculture. And that is 
tending to affect those particular farmers. So it's important uh, that um, as, we, as we develop, as we invest in the agricultural commercialization, we should have models that are addressing not only the climate crisis, but also addressing the inequalities that are there existing. And that may come as a result of wanting to develop an increasing commercialization for the sake of uh, develop, uh, increasing, uh, I mean, growing the national economy. I stop there. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Albert. Um, and now we finally move to Kobina, who is based at the University of Ghana. And the, well, well, yeah, and the University of Ghana project team is focusing its work yeah. on, so, on um, just transition strategies in the transport yeah, sector, sure. which in Ghana is the fastest growing yeah. emitter of greenhouse yeah. gas. <laughs> Um, and is the second largest emitter of greenhouse gases after the electricity generation industry. So Corvina, what have you found to be the main considerations when working on just transition in the transport sector? Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, Nia. Um, merci beaucoup, <coughs> um, um, Teremakasi. Uh, we have been looking in Ghana at the transportation industry, primarily because if you take three countries in the world where the economic growth has been continuous for the last 30 years, normally it's China, Vietnam, and Ghana. Ghana has grown continuously nonstop for 38 years, but it has also brought about a lot of environmental destruction, including sharp increases in greenhouse gases. And in the context of our uh, country, uh, we found out that um, just transition strategies are not particularly well known in, to, to most organizations in Ghana, especially the informal sector. However, the Trade Union Congress of Ghana's formal policies dealing with just transition in various sectors of, of, of the economy. Last year, the government of Ghana came out with a just transition document, which was called Ghana Green Job Strategy 2021 to 2025. In that, it envisages just transition in the four areas, green jobs coordination capacity development projects, green skills development projects, green enterprise development projects and access for green products, then green enterprise financing projects where the government is looking for additional funding to support just transition project. Now, currently the Environmental Protection Agency of Ghana, which is modeled after the system in the United States, is undertaking just transition research and advocacy work in the energy industry, sponsored by the Ministry of Energy and the government. Um, <clears throat> and then in terms of agriculture, which is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, we have many projects in the investors. Now, the Investor of Ghana project team, we have been focusing our work on the just transition in the Ghanaian transportation industry, primarily because the, the transportation industry is the fastest growing emitter of greenhouse gases and is the second largest per unit production emitter of greenhouse gases after the electricity generation industry. Now, since the Ministry of Energy is handling the just transition in the electricity generation, we felt that we should focus on the transportation industry. So what are we doing? Um, basically, we, are, we have been doing research project, which has been financed by climate strategies in two ways. The first one is we have developed an input output analytical framework for the economy of Ghana based on the 2018 table and the emission coefficient from greenhouse gases are based in 2019. And we have validated the model with the 2021 census data. So we have a full input output model of the economy of Ghana. And one of the 17 industries is the transportation industry. So that has allowed us to start looking at various strategies and its impact on the whole economy in terms of job losses, in terms of income. 
And we are moving to the next stage where we are now working with the Trade Union Congress of Ghana, which is made up of 22 unions. We are holding a workshop 15 August 2022 of at least 30 elites. And the Trade Union Congress has asked for a slot of 15, half of the 30, so that it can bring its managers from these 22 unions to attend the workshop. And it's mainly a training in technical input output analysis of just transition, various options, and we come out with a, a workshop findings. And from there, we hope to be able to, um, to spring it up to other areas. Now, we also have undertaken a survey, we just completed yesterday, of 180 commercial drivers randomly selected from 10 out of 50 bus terminals and stations in Accra, the capital city. Accra hosts about half of the vehicles in the country in terms of the commercial vehicles. And about 90% of the population use commercial vehicles. So we are, we are approached as not just being an elite type study where we looked at input output and discussion with the elite organization. We also wanted to look, uh, to talk to the masses the people who actually drive these commercial cars, we wanted to talk to them whether they are aware of just transitions and post setting just transitions, question them how they feel about it. Um, we are now beginning to analyze the data, but the first glimpse of the evidence you have is about 20% of the drivers are aware of just transition. And we also found that three quarters of the drivers own cars. So, we, we think we can get some idea as to what these drivers who operate mainly in the informal sector uh, think about uh, issues with deal with just transition strategies. So to conclude, what we are emphasizing more is elite masses type study. The elites we've been to, the major stakeholders, environmental protection agency, the ministries, the trade unions, and we are scheduled to meet the Minister of Finance as he's preparing to present the 2023 budget, 2023 budget in November, the issue of reintroducing tolls. We have already communicated with them that we have completed a survey and we'd like to share the evidence with them around August uh, with the idea of reintroducing tolls to target private cars to contribute to raising money as a form of income distribution. Because one of the problems that we have in Ghana, apart from the environmental distractions, is also one of the fastest growth in income inequality in Africa. So these are issues. So I would like to conclude with our workshops, which we have invited climate strategies to attend 15th of August. We have a technical input output analysis of just transition jointly with the Ghana Trade Union Congress. They are hosting it. 30th of August is masses elite discussion. Rather than the issue being elite, elite policy makers, we're getting about 10 of these commercial bus drivers and about 10 elite sitting down and discussing issues, including the findings of our survey and also the draft toolkit we have to present to climate strategies and also some financing proposal for funding. So I'll, on this note, I would like to thank everybody. So thank you, Merci Boku, and in Malay, um, Indonesia, uh, Telmakasi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, great to hear what you've been doing in the transport sector. Um, sadly, we have come to time and we don't really have much time or any time for the question and answer session. But um, the questions asked in the chat, um, we'll pass them over to the panelists and we'll get back to you um, via email with some answers. So um, yeah, apologies for that, but we do not have time for the Q&A session. And um, so yeah, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all the panelists and the participants and the climate strategies team for putting on this event. And if anyone's interested, please um, follow the initiative. You can follow us on our Twitter, um, or on our website. If you just Google South to South Just Transitions, it should be one of the first, um, one of the first links. 
So um, thank you again and um, looking forward to hopefully staying in contact with some of you. Um, yeah, thanks and bye.